So thank you all for joining us this evening um, on our nice presentation on creating a family frame, how to set boundaries your child needs to thrive. My name is Karina Restrepo and I'm the prevention coordinator for Greenwich Together, which is our local coalition that mobilizes youth, parents, and community partners to prevent substance misuse and promote mental health. Um, in 2021, Greenwich Together conducted our last youth survey, which surveyed 7th to 12th graders in both public and private schools. And the data from that, show, that survey showed that youth that did not drink or use substances are more likely to have a family that knows where they are and what they're doing, more likely to recognize family rules discouraging drinking, and more likely to feel that friends and family would disapprove. So overall, that's just a small example of why setting boundaries and rules at home is positively correlated with prevention, which is one of the reasons why webinar today is so important. So if you have any questions throughout today's webinar, please ask throughout. Uh, Tracy and Georgette, our presenters, have been so kind to say that you can interrupt the presentation throughout to ask um, questions as you go, as you think of them. So please drop them in the question, um, that Q&A little box that you see on your Zoom page. And I will be checking that throughout. And before we get started, I just wanna take a second to introduce our presenters today, which are Tracy Masella and Georgette Harrison. So just so you know a little bit about them before we start, Tracy Masella graduated from Fordham University Graduate School of Social Service, earning the Dr. Edward L. Curran Award for highest achievement in academics, practical experience, and school service. During her time at Fordham, Ms. Masella worked at the New Haven Family Alliance, developing an adolescent court diversion program, working with adolescents and families in the community through mediation, family therapy, and case management. Ms. Masella was a member of the multidisciplinary clinical staff at Silver Hill Hospital in New Canaan from 2009 to 2018, and since has served as a community outreach consultant for, for the hospital. While at Silver Hill, Tracy worked with adults and adolescents with a full range of diagnosis, including substance use disorders, personality disorders, and mood disorders. She is intensively trained in dialectical behavioral therapy. And currently, Tracy has a private psychotherapy practice in Wilton, Connecticut, and is the clinical director of the recently opened Krasner Adolescent Institute, also in Wilton. And Georgette Harrison is the Director of Clinical and Community Partnerships for the Child Guidance Center of Southern Connecticut. In this capacity, she supervises clinicians, works with young children and families, collaborates with community stakeholders, and provides individual and didactic therapy in English and Spanish to Latinx families. Prior to her tenure in the Child Guidance Center of Southern Connecticut, she served as the Training Director for Child First, a national evidence-based two-generation model that works with young children and families who have been exposed to toxic stress. Ms. Harrison earned her Master of Art and Master of Education in Counseling Psychology from Teachers College, Columbia University, and holds an infant parent mental health postgraduate certificate from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. She is a licensed professor professional counselor in the state of Connecticut and internal agency trainer for the attachment regulation competency trauma treatment model. A rostered child parent psychotherapy clinician, an American psychoanalytic association fellow, as well as a circle of security parenting facilitator. She also writes a column titled Good Enough Parenting for a local newspaper. So you guys are in great hands today for our webinar and I will pass it along to them. Thank you so much, Karina, for having us. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. And, um, you know, Tracy and I uh, wanted to talk to everyone about, you know, creating a family frame. And not just in terms of um, setting boundaries and limits around substance use um, issues, but also just creating boundaries in general. And to talk about why boundaries and limits are important for your family um, and uh, in relationships. 
So it's important to really think about boundaries and limits within your child's developmental needs. And so, you know, um, Tracy and I have different areas of expertise in terms of age group. So what you'll notice when we talk about it is we tend to have sort of similar topics and similar themes, but maybe the way in which you might um, implement some of these strategies will be different based on the age of your child. So what are your child's primary developmental needs? They have the need for nurturing and caretaking. They need someone to take care of them and to nurture them. They also need uh, to go out and explore. That is one of their um, a primary drives. It's that drive for exploration. And all these other tasks, you know, things that they do at school, things that they do with peers, things that they do at home um, or in the community, all of these other tasks that we want to see uh, children accomplishing are really accomplished in the context of these two primary drives or needs, the need to be taken care of and the need to go out and explore. Now, again, depending on your child's age, how those needs or drives are expressed are going to be different, but really the underlying need ends up being the same. And so how you respond as a parent really depends on you as a parent and sometimes with the help of, you know, your support group trying to figure out what is the need that your child is expressing through their behavior. What is their developmental level? Because sometimes you want to take a look at chronological age. Sometimes you want to take a look at um, their maturity level. And also your ultimate goal as a parent. This is why oftentimes, you know, you, you, might, um, you might provide 10 parents with, you know, the same strategy. And that same strategy doesn't mean that it's a bad one, but it might only work for five families. Part of it is because what works for one family will not work for another. And um, it'll depend also on your parenting style and really, you know, what you want to accomplish within your family. That's what we mean by, you know, what is your ultimate goal as a parent? So in um, an early childhood program called Circle of Security, they like to um, provide a picture of essentially these two primary drives or needs as a circle. So at really the base of the circle are your hands or you as a caregiver. You are from an attachment perspective, your child's secure base and their safe haven. And when they go out into the world, that's got being at the top of the circle, they're going out um, to explore. And what they need you to do is to support their exploration, allow them to go out and, you know, sort of motivate them to go out and explore, try new things, um, as long as it's within, you know, something that is safe. And the need that they're expressing is that during this time of exploration, they want you to watch them, they want you to delight in them, to help them as needed, and to just enjoy their exploration uh, with them. At the bottom of the circle is this other primary drive, this drive of going back into the, your hands, into the, their safe haven or their secure base. This is usually when they are hurt, um, in need of comfort, dysregulated, or when they want to share something really important with them. So when they're coming back into their secure base, what they need, what they're saying is they, they need to feel like they're being welcomed back into their safe haven as they come back to you. And what they need you to do is protect them, comfort them, help them uh, organize their feelings. And by that, and we'll talk about co-regulation, Tracy will spend a lot more time um, talking about that. That's what we mean by organizing uh, their feelings, making their feelings sort of just the right size so that they can talk about them without being completely overwhelmed by them. And also, if they're sharing something with you, to delight in them. And so you'll notice that this concept of delighting in your child is common or, or um, 
it's the same regardless of whether they're going out to explore or whether they're coming back in to be taken care of. Now, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about, you know, what's at the bottom of the circle, which is called, you know, um, the ways in which the hands need to be, the ways in which you as an attachment figure, as their caregiver, their big person, what you need to be like in order to, to, to be able to do all of these things as they go out and explore and when they come back to you. This is really where the spirit of um, setting boundaries and limits really live. We often think about sort of discipline as um, being sort of harsh and um, meant to be punitive. And in reality, discipline is really about teaching um, and that we can't teach if we are dysregulated ourselves or if we don't sort of really truly engage in our role as, as a teacher. So boundaries and limits are really not meant to limit your child's exploration. This is the same thing. It, it applies regardless of whether your child is six or whether your child is 16. It's really about helping your child explore safely. And doing so means that you have to take into consideration your child's developmental level, their maturity level, and also what they're asking to do, right? Um, and so in Circle of Security, they talk about the hands always need to be bigger, stronger, wiser, and kind. And you need to be all of those four things. And I know that that sounds like an extremely tall order. And it doesn't mean that you have to like get it right all the time, because goodness knows no one gets it right all the time. Um, and no one is, is expecting you to be. Um, but you have to be bigger, stronger, and wiser than your child because A, you've been around for longer, you are their parent. You know, I joke around um, with my five-year-old that I have two primary jobs, actually kind of three um, jobs when I'm raising her. And that one is to love her like crazy, two, keep her safe, and three, civilize her as much as possible. Um, and so, you know, once in a while I'll tell her like, you know, you don't put your feet up on the, on that table or, you know, we're out and about, like, don't do that. And he's like, are you trying to civilize me? <laughs> um, and it's true. So that, that's one of our, uh, roles is to do that. But one of our biggest roles, right, is to love them and make them feel safe. And in order to make them feel safe, sometimes we have to set a boundary regardless of whether they like it or not. That's a bigger, stronger, and wiser piece. The kind piece is that you have to do so in a way that's not harsh, in a way that you um, are kind when they protest. Um, so whenever possible, you follow your child's lead and whenever necessary, you take charge. And so that sort of really difficult line to walk about, you know, setting boundaries and limits is really about knowing when to take charge, when to not sort of be overbearing or, you know, the, the term now, the helicopter parenting, and when not to be so hands off that your child really doesn't know where the limits um, and the boundaries are or um, they're exploring, but in a way that is not safe. So if we think about it, in every family, we want to consider that there's really a division of responsibilities in every family. It is the child's job, their role, to explore and to test the limits. They're not supposed to like it when you set a limit. They're not supposed, it is not their job to understand that you have to set a limit. It is not their job to make it easy for you to set a limit. It is their job to test it. It is part of becoming um, an independent person. It is our job as an adult to establish the boundaries and the limits and to enforce them when needed. And again, it is your child is not trying to be oppositional or difficult when they protest or they cry or they try to negotiate. Um, 
it's developmentally appropriate. They want to see where the limit is, where the boundary is, and how often um, the caregiver is actually going to um, keep to the boundary and the limit, right? But the fact that your child protests, cries, or negotiates does not mean that your boundary is inappropriate, right? Um, and it is also incredibly appropriate for you as a parent to struggle when you see that your child is angry or sad or frustrated. It is difficult to see your child struggling. It is, and also it also depends on sort of what kind of day you're having. I know that definitely some days I'm much more patient with my children than others. And if I'm having a rough day, um, I have a lot less tolerance um, and an ability to sort of contain my children's anger and sadness and frustration. And so sometimes it just feels like it's easier to just, you know, give in. Um, but you, that's when we need to recognize <clears throat> if what we're doing, is it because we're struggling? Not because, you know, all the things that we sort of tell ourselves to say, oh, I'm doing this because, you know, th this is better for my child or my child is really struggling and so therefore I should give in. We have to sort of own it when it's our own struggle and that, and that we all go through that. So when we think about these moments when you know, you're setting a limit and a boundary and your child is testing it and trying to negotiate, you really, this is a great opportunity to collaborate and to co-regulate. And so what do I mean by that? And I should sort of pause for a second and let you guys know, I forgot um, to mention that, um, my daughter is actually uh, here with me as I'm presenting. So if you hear sort of comments in the background, that's my daughter in the background watching a movie. Um, just um, unfortunately, I, uh, my my son is sick, and we're trying to sort of keep them um, separated. And you know, she she needed to be supervised. <laughs> so um, if you hear comments in the background, please forgive me. Um, so in terms of opportunities for collaboration and, and co-regulation, this is when you would be surprised at how young you can really start this. Um, you know, I, I, I tried to start it with my daughter when she was around four, um, where I would, instead of me sort of coming down and saying like, okay, no, this is like what I said is law and this is what we need to do. Um, Instead, what I tried to do was implement these opportunities for like collaborative problem solving, right? So I would say, like, I know you really want to do X and I'm worried about Y and it's my job to keep you safe. So what solution can we come up with? So for example, this was not an issue around safety, but my daughter, you know, one time said that she really wanted to, you know, have dinner in front of the TV. You know, we we allow that once in a while, but you know, the the only time that we really have to sit down as a family is to eat dinner together, and that's really important um, uh, for for dad and I. And so, you know, that she was insisting that she wanted you know to sit in front of the TV. It was boring to talk to mom and dad and and her brother over dinner. And you know, like I, I can see her starting to escalate. I can see that I'm starting to get frustrated. So I said, you know, I. I can tell like you 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 really want to watch TV tonight and that sounds like a lot of fun. Dad and I really miss you and we really want to have a chance to talk to you. So what what can we do? What can we figure out? And she kind of thinks about it and she says like, well, maybe we can move the dining table to where the TV is. Like let's just move the entire table there. So I'm thinking like, okay, that's not gonna happen. How do I s say no in sort of a nice way? And then she sort of thinks about it and she's like, no, the dining table is too heavy. How about we do a picnic? We sit down on the floor and um, we have dinner there because then we can play while we're eating. Um, and then I get to do something fun and you get to uh, talk to me. And that was something that she came up with at four. So never underestimate the fact that children can really 
come up with really ingenious ideas and, and um, really exercise those like emotional muscles in a way to come up with a good solution that can sort of um, um, sort of meet everyone's needs and that they're much more likely to comply as opposed to you as the parent saying like, no, like this is, you know, we're, we're, we're doing this because I said so. The ultimate goal is co-regulation, right? That means being a partner with your child, even when your child is angry with you because we can't change a boundary. So with things around safety, there are some boundaries that just cannot be negotiated. There are some safety issues or, or safety concerns that it doesn't matter how much they try to negotiate or you know what sort of ingenious problem solving or a solution they come up with, some things just cannot happen. And they're gonna be angry with us. And we are their best regulation partner at that moment, even though we are the ones that they're angry at. So I know that, um, you know, this is usually when I pause and I, I, I ask if people have questions, especially because at this point, people um, want to know how this sort of lines up with peaceful parenting or gentle parenting, which I know has gained a lot of um, sort of traction in the last several years. So before I talk about how this lines up, just wondering if anyone has any questions or um, if they, you want to unmute or put it in the chat. Okay, um, so let me know, Karina, if anyone puts anything in the chat. Um, so a lot of people think about peaceful parenting as the kind of parenting, there's a, sort of two camps about it. People that sort of believe that peaceful parenting are parents sort of that have completely abdicated their responsibility as a parent and let their, they never say no um, to their child. And then there's other people who believe that, you know, um, sort of some of these limits and boundaries um, are actually sort of curbing their child's potential for exploration. Um, and so they, they sort of really gravitate towards peaceful parenting. That's really not what peaceful or gentle parenting is about. Um, it, the, the joke sometimes is that peaceful parenting is not always peaceful. Right, or at least not from the child's end. Peaceful parent, the goal of peaceful parenting is not that the child is never upset. Peaceful parenting is about how we need to be when we parent. It's about how us as grown ups react to our child's big emotions and how we can help them again bring them back down to size without us losing our patience. Um, it's not about not saying no to your child or parenting in such a way so that your child never gets upset because that in and of itself is problematic because if you're always avoiding your child getting upset, you're also sending the message that the idea of like negative emotions are either scary to you as a parent or that you can't tolerate them or also that your child can't survive them right? That somehow these feelings are so dangerous that they're scary for me as a parent, but it should also kind of be scary for you as a child that somehow you might not recover from them. And instead, what we know as a parent, one of the things that we want to teach our children is there's nothing we can't figure out together, right? Like we'll figure this out. We might not have a perfect solution right away, but you're not alone in this. So, so again, peaceful parenting is, is not necessarily about children being peaceful. Thank you, Georgette. That was wonderful. I actually think I'm going to go home and have a picnic tonight. That sounds so nice. What a treat. Um, once again, just before we move on with more information, are there any questions that we can address now before we move on? Happy to answer anything. Okay. Um, all right, so 
uh, Georgette talked a lot about the idea of co-regulation and um, emotions are really vital things in our lives. They are kind of hardwired into our system. It's like the apps on your phone that come with the phone that you can as hard as you press down, you know, you don't get the X to get rid of them. And that's really important. We don't ever, ever want to give our kids the message that their emotions are bad. There are no bad emotions. Yes, there are negative emotions and there are positive emotions, but no emotions are bad. And the more comfortable we get with the expression of emotion, um, it, the easier life will be. We get to that peaceful place easier when, when, when kids and adults feel like they can express themselves emotionally without retribution, without somebody saying that you can't talk like that, you can't feel that, that's wrong. So we all become emotionally aroused. And that's a good thing. Our emotions, which are sort of housed in the in our caveman brain and a part of the brain called the limbic system, and most notably the amygdala. The amygdala is constantly scanning our environment, both internal and external, for anything that might be pleasurable or dangerous. Constantly. So when you get some sort of a feeling like uh, uh, something goes through your your body, that's the amygdala sending signals to different parts of your body, different systems, your heart, uh, your nervous system, your, uh, your temperature might go up or down, your pupils might dilate. That's so that the amygdala is telling the rest of your body, get ready. We might need to do something. We might need to act on this emotion, right? And that's been around since the beginning of our species. So when, when kids are young, even up until their teens and early adulthood, they rely very heavily on the part of their brain that is fully operational by the time they're toddlers. So the amygdala is doing exactly what it needs to do at two, at 20, at 80. The part of the brain that we use for logic and reason and problem solving, all of that is this part of our brain here. And that's the last part of our brain to develop. And what we know is that it's not really fully developed until about the age of 25. So certainly kids, but even teens and young adults, when they're faced with an emotional decision or an intense situation, they're going to default to the part of their brain that they know is going to be working. Because this part of their brain is still a little spotty, right? You can say, as, as I used to say to my kids when they would do something kind of wonky, I'd say, what were you thinking? And they would say, I don't know. And it used to be, it can be frustrating to hear your kids say that, but honestly, sometimes they just don't know because the thinking part of their brain was just offline, just not operational, right? They can maybe tell you what they were feeling in that moment. And we need to create a situation where saying what you feel is okay, all right? So let's say you get emotionally aroused. The system, these, these bodies that we walk around with, these minds that are part of our brains, is going to look to the environment for validation. And what does validation mean? Validation means I understand something about what you're experiencing. Okay? So in using very common language, you're not crazy. I get it. You're not crazy. I understand. So we get emotionally aroused and we look around to make sure that what we're feeling is understandable. Somebody can understand what it is that we're feeling. Babies do this from the crib, right? They cry. They need something. They're feeling something. They might be angry. They might be hungry. They might be tired. They might be um, have a wet diaper. So they become emotionally aroused and their request for validation is they cry. We go to the baby. We pick up the baby. Pat, pat, pat. You're going to be okay. Mama, dada loves you. That is effective validation. You're saying to that baby through your actions, I get it. I understand why you're crying and it's okay. When we feel understood, when we get effective validation, our emotional arousal goes down. Now, fast forward to the teen years, it looks different, but it's exactly the same mechanism of action. Your kid walks in the door, slams the door, throws the backpack down. That's the same as that baby crying in the crib. So kids 
even up until the teen years and even some adults act out their emotions. They don't talk about their emotions. Like a kid isn't going to come in and say, I'm feeling so frustrated with my friend because she said this. And then when she said that, I said this. No, they're going to slam something. They're going to bark at you. They're going to they're gonna act out that emotion, right? They're looking for us to say, I understand or tell me more, right? So what happens if that beautiful little vignette that I described doesn't happen? Same emotional arousal, same request for validation, and the environment responds ineffectively. And often we invalidate somebody, our kids, our partners, our colleagues at work, without even knowing that we're doing it, right? And often the invalidation becomes as be, comes because, as Georgette said, we are feeling something ourselves, right? So kid comes home, throws down the backpack, your emotion is going to be aroused as well. But in order to co-regulate, we have to be able to, this very, very, very sometimes difficult dance of regulating our, our own emotion while we're validating somebody else's right? But if we're not able to do that in that moment, especially in extreme circumstances, right? We could ignore or dismiss their emotion. Oh, stop being a drama queen. We could punish them and say, don't you dare throw your backpack like that. Get up to your room right now, right? We could say, you know, why are you, you should be tougher, right? I mean, this don't, why do you get so upset about these things? It's just, it's not worth it. Um, and all of these things we're doing because we might feel afraid ourselves. We might feel afraid that our kid is um, not able to handle things, should be tougher. Um, we might not know what we should do in this situation. We can always win the battle we validate first. We may not know how to problem solve, but we always know how to validate. So let's say we're not able to do it. The emotional arousal goes up and that looks like an even bigger tantrum. And this, is, this cycle is gonna continue until finally somebody capitulates and gives in. And that's a bad message to teach our kids, right? As, you know, if you, if you wanna get my attention, you just need to ramp up the, the dysregulation. That's exactly what we don't want to happen, right? But we can stop this cycle by taking a moment, taking a deep breath and focusing on validation, finding something about that kid's experience that we can understand and legitimately and genuinely say to them, I understand, this makes sense to me, okay? So we talked about rules, the family frame. So the family frame is, is really, you know, rules, regulations, policies, and procedures. It's your family's, you know, corporate bylaws. It's, the, it's your mission statement. And this should be like in stainless steel, titanium. That doesn't change. As Georgette said, and this is so spot on, it's our job to make the frame and keep the frame. It's their job to push against it. And the minute they find a chink in it, number one, they're going to go through it. And number two, they're going to be scared. They don't want the rules, but they need the rules. And the, and the, and the very, very tricky task of, of um, setting up a family frame is you want to make it wide enough so that they can explore because that's what they have to do. And you want to make it tight enough that, they, that their exploration doesn't result in something dangerous. It's tricky. Rule of thumb, rules are based on safety and they are non-negotiable, okay? We're gonna talk about substance use. Obviously, that's a rule. It is based on safety, right? So kids will often say, well, speeding is a law and you speed, break that, that rule all the time. The, 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 the law of speeding is based on the fact that every time you go over the speed limit, you increase your chance of something dangerous happening some adverse outcome, right? 
So again, it's not that people won't speed. It's that every time you speed, you are increasing the likelihood that you're going to hurt yourself or others. That's why the rules are in place. They're based on safety. It's not to say that people don't break rules. They do all the time. But every time you break a rule, you increase the likelihood that you're going to have an adverse outcome. So breaking rules should result in consequences. So those consequences should be, you know, posted on the refrigerator. They should be ratified by a signature. They, whatever you need to do to have the conversations about the rules and the consequences well before kids have the opportunity to go out and break the rule. Because what you don't want to do is set the consequence when the kid has broken the rule. Because your emotions are high, their emotions are high, and you're inevitably going to say something like, you're grounded for the next 88 years, right? We want the consequences, A, to fit the crime, and we also want them to be enforced. So we don't ever want to set a consequence that we're not going to be able to enforce. Because the minute that we set a consequence and then give in on it, again, that's another chink in the armor that the kid is going to go through. Expectations are different than rules. Expectations are things that we would like to see happen, right? If they don't, it's not going to result in an adverse outcome. It's just going to be, you know, change maybe, I'll, I'll give you an example of an expectation in our house when my kids were growing up. They're, they're grown and out of the house now, but when they were, uh, when they were old enough to drive, we had a, they had a, the, the kid car in the family. And the, um, I offered to give them um, one tank of gas per week. What they had to do was meet the expectation of going once to the dump every week. They could do it whenever they wanted. It didn't matter to me. But once a week, the garbage got taken in the kid's car to the, to the dump, right? If they didn't, if, I, if at the end of the week, there was still garbage in the thing, it doesn't matter. I mean, we didn't generate enough garbage to be you know, evicted from our home. Um, it just meant that they didn't get the gas money for that week. I can tell you that each of them, as they got to the age where they were using the family car or the kid car, each of them only once did not go to the dump. Um, so that's an expectation. There wasn't a big discussion about it. I would just go and check on the, you know, before I was going to put the money into their account, um, I would just check the garbage. If it was there, not a big explosion, didn't matter, didn't change our life. It's just that they didn't get the reward of meeting the expectation. This quote, I found this quote um, actually during COVID, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, early on in COVID um, because COVID was, um, is uh, one of those um, examples in our lifetime, which, you know, hopefully will not come again, but we were all going through the same thing at the same time. And it took away so many uh, of the things that we took for granted. And we found out how vulnerable we were um, when we couldn't do some of the things that we rely on being able to do. Um, and so what we want to do, and, and limits help us do this, is to be able to manage things when things don't go well. And this ties in with being able to express our emotions, right? So if we can adequately express our emotions when things aren't going well, we're met with validation, we can then move through things more quickly. And that makes us much more resilient. Resiliency is failing, getting up, and figuring out a different way of doing things, right? It's not going back to just the way we did things before. And that's sort of this idea of being anti-fragile, that we can actually benefit when we fail because we figure out a way to do things better, wiser, kinder. Okay, any questions about any of that information before we go to the more specific topics? About I have substance one, one question. What if I try to enforce a rule and my child gets very agitated and reacts with a lot of anger? That's when I tend to back down or give in. How do I tolerate the anger toward me? 
Mm. Yep, that's that's the key. Georgia, you want to you want to tackle that one? Sure. <clears throat> I so I'll, I'll give you sort of the typical therapist response. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, the 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 answer that I think not not a single parent ever wants to hear. Um, it depends on why it's so difficult to tolerate your child's anger. And I think that that's where um, being able to talk with friends, with loved ones, with a professional can um, can really help you sort of try to figure out where does that come from? Why is it that your child's protests feel um, like something that needs to be avoided at all costs to the degree that something that felt really, really important to you all of a sudden feels like um, sort of keeping the peace is more important than keeping the boundary. Um, I think that there's also ways in which I think um, it's, you know, some kids uh, sort of express their negative feelings in much um, sort of calmer ways. It, I, I know that sounds a little um, contradictory, but you know, you have kids that um, just because of their temperament and their personality, when they protest, they protest. It's not very intense. They recover quickly and sort of you move on with your life. And so it's, it's, there's some kids where it's just kind of easier to enforce boundaries because their protests don't feel so intense. And then there are kids that either through temperament and personality or because of experience they have learned that if they up the ante, that eventually they might um, get what it is that they feel like they're looking for, not what they need, but what they're hoping for in that moment. And so some kids just personality wise are just more intense. There are kids that um, they're, they become so overwhelmed by their feelings that it's hard for them to recover for the rest of the day. Um, and so you as a parent end up feeling like, um, you start treating them as like a little bit more fragile in a way. Mm -hmm. And then there's other kids that have just learned, like if I really up the ante, eventually mom, dad, grandma, whoever it is that's taking it, like we'll give in. Um, and so I just need to up the ante just enough for them to, to back down. And so really it's, um, it's the exploration, I think, from within to try to understand um, why it is that something that felt important suddenly feels a little less important just because your child got upset. Um, and you mm -hmm. can, again, use your support system um, to try to sort of work through that. And if, if that's not working, that's that's where people like, you know, Tracy and I can help. I don't know, I Tracy, would... if you have other thoughts. Yeah, no, that 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 is... Um that says so much. Um, I think that anger is um, kind of the go-to emotion in our society. We tolerate anger much more than we tolerate the other emotions. Um, and um, it's generally not the primary emotion. I find a lot of times when kids get super angry about a limit, they're very afraid of something happening, usually with their peers. Because remember, as kids move from uh, childhood into adolescence, they are moving away from their parents or their primary caregivers being the sole source of feedback on how they're doing, right? So they, it is developmentally appropriate for them to start looking to their peer group. So if, if you're doing something that's taking them away from their peer group and they are relying so heavily on their peer group for the feedback that they need, to feel okay, um, they're gonna get really afraid when that opportunity to be with the peer group gets taken away. Now, they may wanna spend an inordinate amount of time with their peer group and that's where we have to limit it because they still have to you know, function as a, 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 as a member of the family. But if you can kind of tap into, and this is where an emotional, having the ability to express emotion. So if a kid could say, I'm afraid that these kids won't, invite me to another party if you don't let me go to this party. If your kid is able to say that, that, then you can deal with that, right? That's, that's some really good information for you. And you can validate that, right? I mean, anybody, anybody could understand what it might feel like 
to be rejected by a group of people that you really, really care about. Um, and so if you can get to what's beneath the anger, especially if the anger seems really disproportionate to, to what you're saying, I think then maybe it's easier to validate. It's hard to validate you know, anger, especially when it's being targeted right at you. But if you can just take a moment, not take that anger personally and say, what might be behind that? And it may not be in that moment. It might be when the dysregulation comes down that might be an opportunity to find out about some of this, these kids' fears. Because the kids today, man, it is tough. It is tough, especially like when you round that corner, middle school, high school, uh, the pressure that these kids are under to perform, um, it, it's just, it, it has created an environment where they're very afraid a lot of the time. Great question. Thank you so much. I'll let you know if anything else comes in. Thank you. So now we want to talk to the group a little bit about how to use sort of this framework of, you know, your family frame to think about what are going to be the rules in your family around substance use. And again, every family is going to be different. But the reason why we talk about rules is because there is no way to really think about substance use and, you know, um, you know, we often think about the teen years as like the, the time when, when kids start exploring with substance use. This is a safety issue. And um, oftentimes we hear parents talk about, well, I would much rather my child use while they're under my roof um, so that, you know, they're not out getting drunk in, in a place where, you know, they're not being supervised or, you know, they're going to try it anyway. So, I, you know, I, I might as well sort of be aware of it and help them do it safely. But as we've been um, surveying uh, both Greenwich and surrounding towns and actually asking kids directly, um, the number one reason for kids who say that they don't use alcohol or any other substances, the number one reason they give for doing so is that they know that their parents would disapprove. And so um, taking sort of the approach um, that um, sort of a more lenient approach and the more like, here, let me help you do it in a way that's safe actually doesn't um, it's it's not as protective as we think it is um, in terms of keeping kids um, or promoting um, that kids delay first use as much as possible and that they sort of stay safe even when their peers um, are exploring and the reason why we talk about delaying use as much as possible is because the research also shows that the younger you are at your first use, the much more likely you are to develop a substance use disorder. So, and we're talking now about kids using for the first time at ages 12, 13, um, and they are at much higher risks for, for developing addiction later on in life. Well, and not so later on in life. I mean, we're talking kids that are um, at that point addicted by the time that they get into high school. So the longer that we can um, help kids delay for SUs, the, the more we can protect them and keep them safe. This is not a one and done conversation though. And this is not, I think similar to the way that Tracy talked about, you don't wanna you know, discuss what the consequence is gonna be, or sorry, what the, pun the punishment or the consequence is gonna be once you know, the limit has been crossed. You wanna do it beforehand. It's the same thing with substance use. Um, sometimes we think that kids are too young and we don't wanna introduce sort of thoughts into their head. And so, you know, let's not talk about it. But the reality is, is that if you're not talking about it, their friends are talking to them about it. The media is talking to them about it. Um, movies, social media, they are exposed to uh, messages around substance use at earlier and earlier ages. And so if you're not the one sort of, um, you know, talking to them about it and um, really thinking about what messages you want them to receive, they're going to get them without you. 
So um, according to SAMHSA, there are 3,300 children under the age of 12 that try marijuana each day, under the age of 12, right? So not even teenagers. And that five in 10 children under 12 have sought and obtained prescription medication that was not prescribed for them and that they're not using it for medical purposes. So given that statistic and how prevalent first use is at such a young age, you need to have these conversations with elementary age children. So this is not to say that you have sort of the formal family meeting in the living room where we all sit down and everyone's wondering who got in trouble. Um, this is about finding these natural opportunities that to discuss substance use. Um, so for example, if you're watching a movie together and there is some sort of portrayal of substance use um, or your child starts to ask questions about you know, any medication that they might find in your uh, medicine cabinet, or they, you know, ask about, you know, the alcohol or, you know, the, the, the glass of wine that you, you might be having at dinner. Have these, um, use those opportunities, these moments of curiosity that your child is having to have these conversations. So, and you, they, and actually the conversation is really around trying to ask them what they know. So it's more about listening and, and uh, hearing them out and then sort of talking with them about it. So ask them what they've seen, what they've heard. Provide education. There are a lot of misconceptions out there. And be explicit about your family norms. Do not be afraid to say in this family, this is what we do. Okay. You need to be explicit. If you start to sort of hem and haw and sort of in this particular situation, it would be fine and this, it wouldn't be. That confuses and scares your kids because they realize you're uncomfortable and so therefore this topic is uncomfortable and we should not talk about it. Also be aware of the messages that you send yourself, right? Um, so if, for example, you... Um, the, the, the first thing that, that you or someone in your household say as they, you know, walk through the door is, oh my goodness, I've had such a day, I need a drink. That sends a message that drinking alcohol is one of the best ways to decompress or your primary way of decompressing. And again, it's not necessarily saying that, you know, you're having a bottle of wine each night, but it does send a message about how you, as the grown-up that they look up to, this is how you cope. For preteens, you continue to build on those conversations based on what they are seeing on social media or um, in movies. And at this point, you can also start to have conversations about why they think people start to use substances, right? What they think are the consequences of it and what that person could have done instead. So at this point, they're also probably reading a lot about like, you know, which actor got a DUI, which actor got like fired from the movie because they, you know, couldn't show up on time because they were high all the time. Um, same thing with movies. Start to ask them, why do you think people start to, to drink? Why do people start to use marijuana? What do you think could have been done instead, right? Um, because you also want to start to assess where are your preteens coping skills? Because if they say like, I have no clue what could have been done instead, then we need to think about trying to give them a few more tools for their toolbox. Also come up with a plan for what to say when they're offered their first drink or their first vape or their first, you know, you know here, try this, it's going to make you feel great. You need to practice that with your kids. They should not be trying to figure that out for the first time when something is being sort of thrusted at them. And, you know, I always encourage parents to say, like, this is a perfect opportunity for your child to throw you under the bus. And to say, like, I, I, there is no, I cannot do that. My parents would ground me until I'm 150. 
Um, but you have to practice that. Again, this cannot be a one and done conversation. And then just continue to be curious about what they're hearing from their friends and continuing to talk about the, the family norms. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're able to start this process um, early and often, um, it makes it much easier for teens to navigate the really, really difficult teen years when it is unfortunately in our uh, community so prevalent, use is so prevalent. And there are many parents who condone it and actually promote it. Um, I know uh, families that buy alcohol for their kids. Um, it is illegal. It is illegal to uh, buy uh, alcohol for minors. Um, it is illegal for minors to consume alcohol. It is also dangerous. Um, anything that you put into a developing brain that isn't there already is going to affect how the brain develops. And we work so hard in our communities to have, you know, 4.0 students so that they can get into brand name colleges. Um, why would we allow our teens? And I would actually use this argument with teens that you work so hard in school with your grades and your AP classes and your leadership positions, why would you jeopardize any of that and put your brain at a, um, at a disadvantage um, by using drugs and alcohol? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, kind of uh, uh, counterintuitive. So getting back to our rules, rules regarding substance abuse, these are non-negotiable. Uh, it's illegal. It is dangerous. It is uh, probably the number one safety concern as teens navigate through um, their teen years and young adulthood. Um, the consequences for breaking the rules, which, you know, we know teens are going to break rules. Um, the consequences should be uh, enforceable and they should have to do with what it is that they broke the rule for. So in the case of substance use, it's, you know, Primarily, um, kids are socializing and drinking, so you limit the socialization. You also want to limit the amount of disposable income, if, um, if that is an issue, that kids have, because if they have accessibility to buy things that they shouldn't be able to buy, um, it makes it easier to, to drink and to supply for other kids. So... Um, you want to definitely limit the uh, accessibility and that includes anything that they might find in your home. Um, it's really important that your kids know that they can contact you or another adult um, if they or a friend gets into trouble. That um, yes, there will be consequences for uh, breaking the rule, but first and foremost, you wanna make sure that they have a safe haven that they can contact um, if somebody is in trouble. And that may be, you know, calling 911 as the first line of defense if there's any uh, question about whether a kid is in trouble or not. Um, and then, you know, we are still thinking about caring and exploration. Our kids are still, even though it doesn't seem like it, they're still looking to us to model behavior about how to navigate their world, how to be, you know, an adult, how to have relationships, how to socialize. And so if we are ineffectively managing our relationship with alcohol or drugs, um, that's what they're going to see. And um, we tend to do as our parents do. And so it's really, really important, even when they're kids and you don't think they're watching you, they are. They are. And you're their superheroes. Um, so it's really important that we model the behavior that we want our kids to, to follow. Um, and knowing where your kids are, and this doesn't mean you need to, you know, be on their Insta and be all friends and, you know, have text uh, chats with their friends. No, you're still their parent. You don't need to be their friend, but you do need to have a sense of who they're hanging out with. What are they doing with their time? And, um, uh, you know, how you can, what your communication is going to be like uh, when they're not in the house and you don't know, uh, you know, and, and, and you can't see them with your own eyes. Most importantly, if you think that your teen's behavior, even if you, 
you know, you just don't know, but your gut tells you this might be getting out of control. It might be getting into um, more than just teenage um, experimentation. Don't hesitate to contact somebody um, to ask for help. Pediatricians, somebody at the school, uh, therapists, um, uh, this organization that's running this, you know, wonderful talk that we're having tonight. There are so many resources, resources in our communities um, to get help non-judgmentally with, you know, no questions asked. If you, if you are wondering if your kid is okay, it's imperative that you, you find out, um, just, you know, the best news you can get is, Hey, your kid's doing okay. Um, and, uh, but you want to hear that sooner rather than later. And, um, every, every clinician, um, that I know in this area has a, is so non-judgmental and so wanting to help, um, that it is, it, it, I, I, you know, we can almost guarantee a positive experience for you and your kids. So. Okay, so um, before we go into questions, we just want to um, refer you to some resources that we put together. One is the, the Greenwich Together website that um, you can go to, um, Silver Hill Hospital as well, um, and uh, the Child Guidance Center of Southern Connecticut. Um, a really great book um, to talk about some of um, sort of parenting from like a, a co-regulation stance uh, is called No Drama Discipline um, by Dan Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson. Um, and for the younger kids, um, there's one called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and How to Listen So Kids Will Talk. Um, and then again, if you are concerned about your child, if you need more information, if you need a referral, you can always call the SAMHSA National Helpline, and that's 1-800-662-HELP. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tracy and um, Georgette. So we do have a few questions that came in. So first one is, how can I tell both my child that there are consequences for drinking and at the same time ensure that they'll actually call me if they'll need me, if they'll be afraid that they'll get in trouble. Mm. Yeah, well, um, hmm. you can't guarantee that they will call you. I mean, this, this, this comes down to the connection that you have with your kid, right? Um, and I think that if rules are, are limited to safety concerns and they don't overlap with expectations, that you're, you're really not nagging them about a whole lot of things, that really your rules and the consequences for breaking the rules are down to really, truly safety concerns, I, I have to believe that, um, that those conversations aren't so frequent that they wouldn't be able to come to you if they were in trouble because you're not nagging them about everything. So remember to separate rules and consequences um, and expectations where you're not nagging them about expectations. If they don't meet expectations, they, it, that, that's on them, right? And, and, and the consequences, there aren't consequences other than they don't get a reward or they don't meet an expectation. So if we're keeping the nagging out of it and the constant conversations out of it, because we're really only needing to talk about those rules um, as pertaining to safety issues. Um, I think that we open up the lines of communication so that they can come to you because they understand that it's, it's in the domain of safety and it's okay to talk to you about that. Okay, hey, thank you so much, Tracy. And our last question is, what do I say to my teen when substance use is normalized by their peers and society? And they say things like, it's not that big of a deal now, it's legal in regards to marijuana. Yeah. Georgette, you wanna talk about peer pressure? <laughs> I I think you 
I think you talk about this the way that you talk about any other way in which your family rules might be different from everyone else's. Right. <clears throat> and I know that um, parents sometimes feel pretty alone in being like the, the, the parent that doesn't allow certain things and, you know, they might be getting pressure themselves from the other parents or um, that they worry that their their child is going to be sort of a social pariah if they um, sort of enforce these rules. But I think it's really no different than any other conversation around how your family rules may look different. Um, and this is why your family rules are the way that they are. And tell me, um, I think it's it's really about listening to your kids and what their concerns are, more so than always trying to explain your stance, because mm -hmm. your stance isn't going to change. Y you may not even be able to change your child's perception of your stance, but if they can at least feel heard, right, um, and feel like you are listening to them, which doesn't necessarily mean you're going to change anything about the rule. But at least they feel heard. Um, I think oftentimes we sort of, in a way, almost over identify with their child's fears. We remember what it was like to be that age. We remember what it was like to be the odd one out. Sometimes that gets brought up when we see our child talking about it and our own like earlier stuff gets brought up. Um, but I think ultimately what you need to think about is, is that, you know, again, right? Like I joke about it with, with my kids, but my main job is to love you, keep you safe. And then if there's time, I'm going to civilize you. <laughs> but if I'm doing something that is not just me loving you and protecting you, then I got to think about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Yeah, I can't, I can't emphasize enough that um, what you said, Georgette, we don't have to answer every question that our kid has. There can be some unanswerable questions. We don't have to problem solve everything with our kids. And so these conversations where they come to you and they say, well, you know, how am I supposed to uh, what am I supposed to say to kids when, uh, you know, when I have to constantly say that I can't go to parties or, you know, when drinking's okay and you don't, you say it's not, I would ask a question back. Tell me more. Well, what do you say to those kids? What do your friends say? Open up the conversation to tell me more, be curious with them. You don't have to have the answer for them for every question. And these are opportunities for us to, you know, have a conversation with our kid, staying emotionally regulated while we're having these conversations. Again, we're modeling behavior. Let's, let's talk about this. This is a tough one. I don't have all the answers. I just know what my job is. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my job. And I'm happy to have a conversation with you about this because this is a really tough thing that you're going through. Let's talk more. You don't have to answer all the questions in terms of problem solving. But if you give them your time and attention, it goes a long way. Absolutely, thank you so much. So we have one more question that came in to the question box. This is from a provider. So as outside providers, how do we work with parents who are not open with child substance use, but are also aren't open to hearing the child out or working with the child? I know, especially for caseworkers who do not have children, it's hard to hear, well, you don't have children, you don't understand. Hmm. You know, yeah. I <laughs> Go that, ahead, that's, yeah, that, that's a hard one because yeah. I, I think there's two things there. The, the first part is what I'm assuming um, the, the provider meant was that um, it said, you know, you, who are not open with the child substance use. So are, are, are they potentially denying that the child is using or that it's that big of a deal or 
um, and, and alongside that, that they also don't want to necessarily hear hear the child out, right? So that's one. And I think the other one, I'll I'll let Tracy sort of <laughs> answer that one. But I um, I'm thinking about the 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 other one, the the other question that you had about how difficult it is as a provider when um, a parent says, "Well, you don't have children, you don't know what it's like." And you know, having heard that both when I didn't have kids, um, and I I often don't self disclose that I have kids. Mm -hmm. um, because when a parent says that, it's really not about whether you have kids or you don't. It's about whether they feel like you can, essentially them sort of acting out in a way because they feel, they don't feel understood. They don't mm -hmm. feel that you are empathizing with how difficult parenting is, how um, difficult some of these decisions feel and that you're just trying to do your best as a parent and that you know you kind of have the sinking suspicion that you're messing it up and you kind of don't love it that other people are noticing um and so how do i protect my my sense of self as a parent is to say well you don't know what you're talking about because you're not a parent right so so i think this is this isn't really about whether you have the lived experience of of being a parent or not it's about how do we work on that relationship with the parent so that they can in a way how do we help parents regulate and empathize with them without necessarily agreeing with them the same way that we would want that parent to empathize without necessarily agreeing with their child yeah chef's kiss for that one that was great in terms of you know working um as a provider with families that might not be um forthcoming they might be resistant or uh resisting of help um i just set a goal um and it's not my goal it's the family's goal what's your goal why are you here you, you know you're here voluntarily let's set a goal. It's going to be your goal. And you, all of the work that, um, that we do when we're with this family is working towards that goal. Things are going to come out if, if you don't hyper-focus on uh, substance use or self-harm or um, anger issues. If you set a goal that all the family can agree upon, um, just stay focused on that goal and everything is if if they're all working towards their goal and continually we remind them of that goal then things that are getting in the way of this family meeting that goal are going to come out okay thank you both for taking the time to do this presentation and answering everyone's questions i don't see any more questions in the chat um so last call if anyone um has any questions as we're wrapping things up here so i will send a follow-up uh email to everyone that attended the training with these resources as well as a copy of this recording in case you missed any part of this training or um came in late and as well as you know the contact information for Tracy and Georgia in case you do have any questions that you think of after the fact because that happens sometimes and uh, if you liked today's presentation and would like to be more connected with Greenwich together please check out our website follow us on Instagram and Facebook for future events we actually are collaborating with two upcoming events that I just dropped the flyers in the chat for so if you're interested in attending one is on Monday. It's a film showing of Angst, which is um, a movie on anxiety. And there will be a panel afterwards with a guest mental health specialist, as well as youth to answer questions after that. And there's also the Greenwich Vigil coming up on November 13th, which will be a community event to raise awareness around mental health and addiction issues. So uh, please check those out if you're interested in attending. And again, thank you so much for everyone who was able to make some time for this this evening.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you.